Super. Um, our, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Keith Bolson. Um, when I think of silage, I think, well, either way, when I think of Dr. Bolson, I think of silage, or when I think of silage, I think of Dr. Bolson. So I think that tells you a lot. Uh, Dr. Bolson got his, uh, is a native of Illinois, got his PhD here at the University of Nebraska, I believe worked with Dr. Woods, and, uh, and then embarked on a 32-year career at Kansas State University and did a lot of research on corn silage, particularly storage and, and so forth. Since his retirement, he and his wife, uh, Ruthie, work, uh, continue to consult and in the area related to silage, uh, very focused on silage safety, and we've had him on programs focused on that topic in itself. But uh, uh, I gotta also share, I saw Dr. Berger's here, and I didn't know this, but uh, Dr. Berger did, one, did, did a degree working with Dr. Bolson, so that was something I learned. So. Appreciate you coming. Dr. Bolson currently reside, living in uh, Austin, Texas, so it's great to have him up here in Nebraska. To me, it feels like Austin, Texas right now outside, so thanks for coming. Thanks, Galen. Morning, everybody. Morning. How many have heard me give a presentation on silage before? Yeah. I've got at least four people in the room who had my principal's livestock feeding class at Kansas State University, too. Fasten your seat belts because it's going to be a fast ride. Well, that's, that's forward. Yeah. How are we doing on pulling my presentation up? I had an incredible day yesterday. I spent a couple hours with uh, Terry Kloppenstein. He was on my committee. Matter of fact, I was one of the first uh, uh, grad students that Terry signed off on. And uh, along with Walter Woods, I uh, spent an uh, hour and a half or two hours with Larry. Uh, he was my grad student from uh, 1973 to, to 1975. Uh, actually, my third official grad student, uh, my first grad student uh, unofficially was Les Hibba from uh, Wilbur, Nebraska. Uh, many of you know Les, uh, they're masters with me. Uh, so, silage safety shrink and methods to control losses. Let's get started. There we go. I only have two photos of, with my father below the age of 10. I was two when that picture was taken, Beam in Illinois. Uh, my dad had uh, eight brothers and sisters, all but one aunt farmed. Uh, this photo was taken near Lovington, Illinois in 1953. That's my grandmother. She passed away two years later. Uh, that's my dad circled. That's his four brothers. That's Uncle Floyd. Why would I show a picture of Uncle Floyd? Bolson clan made homemade ice cream in the summer. We were Uncle Floyd's one night, summer of uh, 1964, and I was a uh, junior at the University of Illinois. Uncle Floyd said, you know those damn guys in Champaign haven't done anything to help me in the 30 years I've been farming. <laughs> that shocked me, you know, because I thought the university was a great place. Well, you know, I woke up in Manhattan, Kansas seven years later, and I was one of those damn guys at the university. And I told my grad students, I said, you know, we have a responsibility to take something back to the end users, the producers that we're working for when we finish a research trial. I feel I never wanted my Uncle Floyd to, to uh, say that about me. That's the year I graduated from high school. I was a John Deere tractor, uh, uh, one of the first ones that my dad uh, bought. Uh, why did he go from uh, one color of equipment to the other over about a two year period? What did it have to do with service, didn't it? You bet. Uh, and the last year mom and dad farmed uh, Dad had a small Angus cow herd that he thought he needed when he retired. Told this story the other day. Uh, he got that cow herd the first year. He's going out to feed hay in January, slipped on the ice, broke his leg. And Mom said, you know, we really don't need those cows. And uh, so he had uh, one of his nephews come and take care of things. Well, I got to K-State July 15, 1971. Don Good brought me into his office in October, changed my job description, put me in charge of the department silage program. I said, Dr. Good, I don't know anything about silage. I grew up on a corn soybean farm. I studied feedlot nutrition in Nebraska. I said, there's 14 silos at the research farm. He said, Bolson, you're a young man, you got plenty of time to learn. So I inherited those 14 silos. So on June 6, 1972, that's Ken Conway, one of my grad students. We're looking at the cheesy dough stage of hard red rental wheat, right? Wheat was $1.19 a bushel in 1971. I met Walter Porter 
Our reporter was an innovator during wheat and barley silage. So, textbooks said cheesy dose stage for growing your background in cattle, right? Chop my first load, put it on the Coster moisture tester, 56% moisture going into a 10 by 50 silo. Was I going to have a train wreck on density? You bet. Called Bruce Clevenger, Dotson Silo Salesman, Wichita. Bruce, I let my wheat get too dry. He said, you got a fire hydrant. Made my first silo, made my first mistake. Went on sabbatical, built the small bunkers, played my last basketball game in the Philippines. The game got rained out. Met Ruthie. Uh, Lord gave me a second chance. Retired uh, June 7, 2003, moved to Austin, Texas. So many silage pits for a little time. Been blessed the last 13 years. Ruthie and I have probably seen more silage pits than other, any other two people on the planet. It's a lot of fun. Larry, I found, found this photo on my uh, computer last night. Uh, I went through a bout of uh, leukemia in 1997-98. And uh, my grad students at Christmas time, and I was quarantined at home for three months. Grad students uh, at Christmas of 1997 put this plaque together for me. And I had 40 graduate students uh, when, I, when I retired. And uh, uh, it was actually Lance Huck's idea, my PhD student from Scott City. But uh, pretty proud of that name right there, too. Uh, so that's a prized possession of mine in my office at, uh, at home. And I found this picture, Larry. <laughs> you don't know how hard I looked last night to try to find this picture. I knew it was on my laptop someplace. Larry, do you remember this? I think we borrowed that chopper from the agronomy department. It was a, a, a plot harvester. And uh, I think, I think these, uh, these plots were down at uh, the Pretty Prairie Station, weren't they, Larry, uh, south of Hutchinson? And this would have probably been, uh, depending on the stage of maturity, Larry, help me out. It would have, if it was in the boot stage, it was around the 10th of May, probably. It was in the soft dough stage. It was probably around the, the first week in, uh, in June. So I can see Larry smiling back there. Man, I'm glad I found this picture, Bob. <laughs> well, silos and silage. Uh, I got to case in 71. Made my first silage in 72. Then Brent found this in the library. Bulletin 6, June 1889. Kansas State Agriculture College. I want to read the summary. Reported cattle performance and sources of losses in an 80 ton capacity silo. 7% of the weight of the whole plant in siled versus weight removed could not be accounted for, so the authors explained it as a loss by evaporation. Bob just talked to us about that evaporation loss, didn't he? Well, my point is they measured forage in silage out. Our most important efficiency criteria in a silage program, and they did it in 18. 88-89 at Kansas State Agriculture College. Wow. Five years later, Agriculture College, book number 48. Again, the summary. 77% of the forage sod was sound and available for feeding. The measured recovery. Shorter chop lengths of one half inch compared to one inch resulted in closer packs and cattle ate it up cleaner. I can send the measured density and the measured intake. Now, density and intake. Did my pre predecessors at Kansas State Agriculture College do good research, Bob? Absolutely. All I did was carry on their tradition. Carry on their tradition. Keith Bolson's top 12 advances in the silage industry in the U.S. during my career. What are they? Awareness of silage safety. Me and Mark Horn and Sorghum, decision-making software, globalization of silage, 17 international conferences, high-capacity self-propelled forage officers, impact of aerobic stability, impact of density, kernel processors, lactic acid bacterial inoculants, slash L. Buchneri, Austin Berry film, recognition of the four phases of every silage and the silage triangle. What do you notice about my list? It's in alphabetical order. Prioritize them as it affects your silage program or silage programs you work with, okay? I've done that. I'm going to spend time on that. That's my priority list right there, okay? We can come back to that. Silage, wow. How much did we put up last year in the U.S.? How much did we put up in Iowa and Nebraska? As it's tracked by the National Ag Statistics Service, these numbers come out around the 1st of February every year. I've tracked them back to 1971. Iowa and Nebraska put up 13.69 million tons of silage last year across all crops. 
almost 8.2% of the total tons of silage in the U.S. were in Nebraska and Iowa. Am I excited about this conference? Absolutely. We're in the heart of silage production in the beef industry. Absolutely. Now, if you look at, at, at where the vast majority of the total tons are put up, where, where, where is that tonnage? It's where the black and white cows are, sure. But I'm saying that the Nebraska and Iowa have a very important silage industry as it relates to the cattle industry, the beef cattle industry. So what's the real cost of silage? Remember being on Saxon Homestead Farm, Cleveland, Wisconsin, January, uh, December 19, 1999. They had a silage issue. I said, what was the cost of getting this silage here? And one of the brothers said, $19.10. I said, divide by 0.75. Then I said, divide by 0.9. All right, let's go to the day's numbers. You've got all your costs in, and let's say it's $50 a ton for corn silage. I don't know what that cost is going to be. I don't know what the bushel price is going to be on corn yet. But if I divide that initial cost of getting that pit, and I use that term generically, for a pit bunker pile, divide by 0.75, I've got 66.66. I lost 25%. Divide by 0.9, I get 55.55. Who has the cheapest cost of feeding a ton of silent? Somebody losing 25% or somebody losing 10%? Ruthie and I have one goal in mind every time we visit an operation when it comes to their silage management program. Well, two goals. I'm going to talk about the first goal later, safety. The other goal is shrink loss. Put a program in place that gives you an opportunity to have a single digit shrink every time you make silage. Are we going to be successful every time? No. It's a biological world. We're not going to hit a home run every time. We're not going to have a single need to shrink every time. But let's have an infrastructure and a program in place that gives us that opportunity. So, principles of silage. Aerobic, there are four phases. Rich Mutt described them in 1991. Aerobic fermentation, storage, and feed out. Any one of those phases can prevent me from reaching my goal. Bob, I like this summary from Peter McDonald's book, 1980 talks about the biochemical changes in the ensiling process. Plant enzymes, lactic acid bacteria, neuron bacteria, clostridia, yeast, mold, aerobic bacteria. Bob talked about these. Four of those five have red flags on them, don't they? They're negative. And there should be a half a red flag on lactic acid bacteria. Because in C.J. Lynn's work at K-State in 1989-90, where he looked at the microflora on our corn and alfalfa at the research farm, 90% of the lactic acid bacteria were heterofermenters. And Bob talked about that. They were not the ones we wanted controlling the fermentation. The Silas Triangle. Tabina Schmidt, my grad student from Atwood, Kansas, took this picture. That's David Briner, Mill Creek Herford Ranch. David had been out of the silage business for several years. He was nervous. I had three of his four children in my feeds class. I said, David, we'll come down when you're chopping the first day. Great. So I loaded up Mary Kay, Estelle, and Tabina. In the van, we went off to David's. Tabina took the picture. That's the last of the 35 acres of corn that David bought from his neighbor, and there's a silage contractor from Dover, Kansas, doing the chopping. And Tabina coined the term the silage triangle. David was the end user, wasn't he? The beef operation, the silage contractor, the crop grower. 90% of the corn silage in, in the U.S. involves at least two points of the triangle. Yeah. Probably 60 to 70 percent involves all three points. The triangle creates opportunities to access technology. The triangle also can create opportunities to have miscommunication. And a rule of thumb or a definition of when my corn is ready to chop for silage is not the day the contractor shows up. However, oftentimes that might be the case. What we want to be careful, but Kansas State University and I'm still Professor Emeritus, I'm very proud of that. And we still have a website. We want to be careful that we're not pointing fingers at one point of the triangle and not the other. We've got to get everybody on the same page. That's my point. We have to communicate, get everybody on the same page. So, fine-tuning a silage program. I'm only going to talk real quickly about three things. That the silage maker controls every time you make silage. 
reach a higher silage density. Apply the best seal and manage the delivery. How many had somebody feed silage on your operation today, this morning, already? Nobody? Yeah, a few hands go up. Yeah, we're going to come back to that. Density, Bob talked about it. As an academic community, we dropped the ball on density until the Wisconsin survey. 20 counties, Rich Muck, Brian Holmes, uh, and found that the average density was only about 14.3 or 14.5 pounds per cubic foot. Here's Kurt Ruppel's work, the relationship between dry matter density and dry matter loss, it's an inverse relationship. Anything I can do to increase the density drops dry matter loss. And I use as a rule of thumb, I'm going to talk of pounds of dry matter, and I know we ought to be talking fresh bulk weight density. But my, my graph's not fresh bulk weight density, so forgive me for that. But as a rule of thumb, for every one pound of higher dry matter density I can achieve, I'm going to drop the dry matter loss by one to one and a half percentage points. So, I'm, if, so if I'm at the average of 14.5, I can take that to 17.5. I'm going to drop my strength loss by two and a half to four percentage points by just achieving that higher density, okay? The spreadsheet software. If you don't have the Holmes Buck spreadsheets on your computer or your iPad, and I brought this up here for a reason because I've got them on my iPad, okay, you need it. It's horseshoes and hand grenades. And there's a real world feedlot example, Kersey, Colorado, September 2006. Ruthie and I went there in July. They needed to fix their silage program. And they had issues with density, and we used the spreadsheets. And a week before they were going to start chopping, the packing contractor from Garden City said, I'm not going to bring three tractors. I'm only going to bring two because the company did your densities last year, and they were 14 pounds. You're OK. But we fought for the third tractor. We got it. Okay? Use the spreadsheet to predict it ahead of time. Because we have a disclaimer on the K-State Silage website. We are no longer taking core samples for density. Why? Safety. Safety. Use the spreadsheets ahead of time. We did a meeting in Tolvas, New Mexico, in January of 2005. Talked about the spreadsheets and density. At the break, a silage contractor came up and said, the Lord has blessed me the last 14 years with Michelangelo. Wow, who was he talking about? His primary blade push tractor operator. Joe Martin's in the room. He remembers this guy. He's the Michelangelo for a silage contractor that I had the privilege to work with. Okay? There's the Michelangelo there. Okay? I did major, major in art at the University of Illinois. When I Googled Michelangelo, I didn't realize it was all one word the first time, but I was a class. <laughs> I wondered when somebody was going to catch that. <laughs> Actually, I was a classmate of Dick Butkus at the University of Illinois. That, he was quite a guy. He was quite a guy. That'll, that'll, uh, that'll date me just a little bit. So anyway, we got it wrong in the textbook. We got density wrong in the textbook. We said some pretty stupid things. How we increase density. Drop the delivery rate. Oh, yeah, that's going to happen, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. Increase tractor weight, yes. Increase number of tractors, absolutely. Decreased forage layer thickness, not always possible. But I, I have a skilled operator and a long ramp. And Bob got it right on the ramp, one to four. Then we said fill silos for greater depths. Not a good idea, why? Safety and, and, and time. Respiration occurs fast. And we don't, gravity takes too long. And then we said pack for a longer time at the end of the day. That's a waste of time on diesel fuel. When you pack the last layer like you pack every other layer of the day, get off it, go home, and get a good night's sleep. I've had sons and daughters say, would you put that in writing for dad? <laughs> and never pack on yesterday's surface this morning while you're waiting on the first load. All we're doing is stirring air back into it. Yeah. Apply the best seal. How many like to seal a pit? It's a favorite job, isn't it? And I got to tell you, we dropped the ball at Kansas State University on sealing. We 
dropped the ball, big time, until Gilly Ashbell came on sabbatical in 1988 from the Volcano Institute in Israel. We did a survey, only 17% of our silage pits in Kansas in 1988-89 saw a sheet of plastic. 3.1 million tons. Larry, whose fault was that? It was mine. I'd been the captain of the silage team since, 90, since 71. So we built 10 small bunkers out just each of the sheep unit. Okay? And we studied the dynamics of the top four feet. And a PhD dissertation and two master's thesis later, we had the answers on ceiling. Wow. Wow. This guy right here stood by that pine tree and wrote out a $5,000 check when he saw the first results. Richard Porter. And said, Folsom, those little bunkers just made me more money than anything else you've done. And he started sealing his pit. Auction bearer film, it's a no-brainer. Use the auction bearer film. Use the auction bearer film. I was out in Garden City, May 24, 2016. That's the sorghum silage pit. Wow. Reputation feed yard. Had a real good discussion. Real good discussion. What are they losing? What are they losing? Just in feed inventory. About $56,000 they could net save by sealing the pit with the auction bird field. Yeah. It was uh, 620 feet long. It was 88 feet wide and it was 25 feet deep. I conservatively estimated they were losing 60% of the original top three feet, and they could be only losing 15% of it. Seal the pit. Seal the pit. Oh, don't you love the Internet? Highway 60 between Hereford and Clovis. Feed yard on the east side of the road. I've been going by it since I moved to Texas in July of 2003. I took this photo from Highway 60. I didn't trespass. So I got a real good idea of the depth of this pit. There's four of them at this feed yard. And MapQuest on uh, April 15th of 08. Here's our photo. Here's the four pits. These two are empty. These two are being fed. New Earth, same day. These, this one's being fed. These two are empty. But I've got a real good idea of the length of these bunkers from the Internet, don't I? And I can calculate what this feed yard is losing in feed inventory because they're not sealing their pit. About $60,000 per bunker per year at $45 corn silage. Four bunkers. That's almost a quarter of a million dollars worth of feed inventory. Poof. Poof. Yeah. Somebody's paying a lot of money for the top two and a half feet of crud. Will I feed cattle at that feed yard? Will I feed cattle there? Manage the delivery. Silage is perishable. Bob talked about that, the dynamics and the science behind it. Larry, we ignored aerobic stability until uh, the early 80s. I learned all about it on sabbatical leave at the Grassland Research Institute in 1978. Okay, here's a feed yard. I don't want to beat up on feed yards. I'm a feedlot nutritionist. Here's a feed yard. We got to get from here to here. Right? So how many times does this silage get exposed to air? Let's count them. And this feed yard is not in Iowa, Nebraska, or Kansas. So nobody's going to be insulted. First time is air ingressing 30 inches into the face because of the low density. Second time is loose on the floor of the pit. Third time is in the payloader bucket. Fourth time is waiting here by the feed mill to be taken over here to the conveyors the fifth time so it can go into the feed truck. And finally, the seventh time is exposed to oxygen is when the TMR is delivered into the bunk. Wow. You know what the bottom line is on that? We can do better. This is not a plan, is it? Surf spoilage. Bob talked about it. I retired. Don Croft asked me that the day we were moving to Austin, Texas, Bolson, what didn't you accomplish that you, you wish you could have done before you retired? 
I said, Don, remember my grad student in Silver Lake, Lance Whitlock? Oh, yeah, good boy. Married to Darren's daughter from Wichita, didn't he? I said, yes. I said, I never got to take his research to the next level. I've talked about this research. We created the surface spoilage, we fed it. This is an interesting photo. Filled the little bunkers three feet. 47, I have peripheral neuropathy, so you're going to see me stumble around just a little bit. Uh, lost my train. Oh, three feet. So we filled the little bunkers three feet, 47 pound fresh weight density. We went off and left them for three months. And then we sealed them up. We came back and got ready to feed. Lance didn't have three feet of corn silage, did he? What happened to the top 14 inches? Anybody? Poof, it evaporated. It's gone. <laughs> and we had, we had a seven inch slime layer. And because we knew ash, we could calculate the amount of that slime layer that went into the ration. Seven white steers fistulated. I've been booed by every farmer in northeast Kansas. Have you been to Axel, Kansas? Larry has. I may remember Billy Rural Abel and, and uh, David Ames and Jack Riley. <laughs> Larry knows where I'm going with this story. First September and uh, first Friday in September of 1971, I got to K-State. I got kind of into being a football referee by those three guys. So I refereed my first game in uh, Axel, Kansas. And I refereed high school football for 25 years. It was a humble hobby on Friday nights, I'll tell you that. Hey, Bolson, we're seeing high dog tonight. Hey, you left your white cane in the locker room. And they loved to see the zebra go down. I remember all three times I got run over, too, boy. <laughs> anyway, back to where I was. Throw a forward pass, and three things can happen, and two of them are bad. Feed surface spoilage, three things are going to happen, and all three are bad. All three are bad. Intake's going down, forage mass is going to disappear, and fiber digestibility crashes. So here's the dry matter intake data, the negative associative effect. And here's the NDF digestibility, negative associative effect. Ben Brent and Lynn Harbors and I let Lance make a crucial mistake in his design. Our lowest level of slime was too high because it wasn't a linear effect. So I'm going to step outside the line. Scott City, Kansas, March 2015. Chuck Grimes is sitting back there, and he was with me when I took this photo. There's an earth berm, 2,500 ton capacity corn silage bunker, about 12 miles west of Scott City. Hadn't changed since I was there in November of 2001. It was just the same, 15 years later. Across the road are these cattle. Look just like the same cattle I saw in 2001. Producer hasn't changed a thing. Whose fault is that? That's mine. He apparently doesn't know about the research. I'm going to think outside the box. Let's just drop intake half of what Lance's lowest level of slime drop intake. And I'm backgrounding these cattle. So my intake's going from 17 pounds to 16.5. That's the only thing I change. My gain goes down, my feed conversion changes. I leave time out of recovery the same, and I'm losing $4.70 worth of live weight gain per ton and sile. And I'm generous on dry matter recovery at 87.5%. In no way, that's 87.5%. Okay, so we can go a little further. Drop dry matter recovery at 82.5. Drop NEG a little bit. Lever intake the same. Now look what happens to the dramatic live weight gain potential lost. Yeah. Okay, let's get serious. Safety. How are we doing on time? 10 o'clock. We're in good shape. 15. Safety. It's our number one silage problem globally. Globally. What was this young man doing on this dairy in northeast Ohio? He was taking a tire sidewall out of the silage for his buddy in the payloader. So his buddy didn't have to get out of the payloader. Wow, because the sidewalls had dropped down from up here. 
Think safety first. Dennis Murphy said it best at the in-race conference in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 2006. We have nothing to lose by practicing safety. We have everything to lose by not practicing it. So what are the safety hazards in a silage program? Fall from heights, run over by machinery, tractor rollover, entanglements, crushed by an avalanche complacency. August 6, 2001, you know, when the light hole in a dairy, I saw an avalanche up close and personal. Standing with this pickup, they'd undercut, and boom, in a split second it came off. About 30 tons. A K-State PhD grad had been standing about right here pulling a sample two minutes before the avalanche. And that evening at dinner, I said, Dave, you realize how close, close you came to dying this afternoon on so-and-so's dairy? And he wasn't even phased by it. Wasn't even phased by it. Don't do something stupid. We've all been there and done that, haven't we? We've all been there and done that. One of my grad students took this picture. That's pretty stupid, isn't it? That's pretty stupid, isn't it, for a lot of reasons pulling core samples, because that happens, doesn't it? We've all had a near miss, haven't we? We've all had a near miss. Better Herd Management, October 2000, Tim Shoemaker. Mac is a good friend of several of us here in this room. Mac Rickles, Comanche, Texas. Even though I was standing 20 feet in the face, 12 tons of silage collapsed on me, I didn't hear or see anything. I'd been in pits hundreds of times. You just kind of become complacent because nothing ever happened. It took that once. Man dies in a farm accident about eight miles east of Happy Valley. Logan, PA, Sugar Valley Volunteer Fire Company responded to a farm accident Tuesday, Kenneth Hedinger, 63, trapped in three tons of silage. Attempts to resuscitate Hedinger were unsuccessful. I was there four years later, and this, this was now the sign on the bunker wall. A friend of mine witnessed this accident. As Hedinger walked over to pull one more sample, and that's when the silage fell on him. He didn't make it. Claremont, New Hampshire, website accessed August 21, 2010. Boy buried in feed pile. And this is a still shot off a of video. There's the top of the payloader. There's two rows of bales. That's at least 14 feet. There's the top of the pit. Let's see if we can make this work. Uh, Let's see, how, how do we click on this? Uh, I'll get her. Mark, you got it? Yeah. Okay. We're just going to play about 20 seconds of this. Well, Gene, the boy goes to school here at the Maple Avenue School, and earlier today the school district sent out a statement saying that the entire community is deeply saddened by this horrible accident. A bike ride on this Claremont farm turned tragic for an 11-year-old boy. So the boy was in uh, a silage crib where there was a large pile of silage with an overhang, and that overhang collapsed. The police chief says Andrew Wheeler ended up pinned under the pile on Tuesday, and it may have been a good 15 to 20 minutes before he was pulled out. No one was working on it, and no one, was, no one actually saw what happened. Uh, there was uh, someone nearby who heard something, that's, and, and that's good, that resulted in the... Now let's look at the rest of it. Boy buried in the feed pile dies. Jerry Wheeler died two days later. Whew. A lot of us got this email. A lot of us here in this room got this email from Luciana Jotman. Bob Charlie got it. Last Thursday, my friend and partner, Doug DeGroff, was crushed by a silage pile. He's thankfully lying in a hospital bed as I write this and able to move all of his limbs. Doug DeGroff's a hero. He told the story of Faye Holeen. Doug DeGroff photographs every, a dairy nutritionist in Tulare, California, photographs every silage face that he samples for his clients. This is the silage, oh, this is the silage that collapsed on Doug DeGroff. Drove himself to the hospital with a broken back. Faye Holeen said it's the most powerful story she'd ever done. Five days after the accident, Bob Charlie called Ruthie and I and said, would you write a safety handbook for Lalamon? So we wrote the first edition. This is the second edition. Take home message on safety before we look at one more video. It's really not about shrink loss, feed conversion, cost of gain, or closeouts. 
It's about sending all your employees home safe at the end of the day. Bottom line of a silage program is not safe. Then nothing else about it really matters. Okay? How many of you have heard about this accident here at Dexter, New Mexico? January 13th, 2014. This avalanche took the life of Jason Edward Leedingham. It's real world, I'm going to show you about seven minutes of video and we'll be done. While Mark is loading that up, I want to read the cover letter to the video. I'll try to read the cover letter. January 13, 2014, Jason Edward Leedingham was working alone in an overfill bunker silo when a massive amount of silage collapsed on him. Because he was working alone, no one witnessed the avalanche and no one knew where to start looking for Jason. It took hours to locate his body under the silage. My the Office of Medical Wilson. Examiner... I'll be 71 no, in hold May. On, hold that. Uh, the Office of Medical Examiner determined Jason died by a mechanical asphyxia and had no other life-threatening injuries. When his body was recovered, a sample bag was found by Jason's left hip. The video, 17 minutes, contains video footage of the recovery efforts, portions of deposition testimony of a sheriff's deputy, first responder, farm owners, managers, employees. In voiceover, you'll hear me. Video is produced in loving memory of Jason, father, husband, son, brother, friend, and silage haulback driver. Family hopes Jason's death will encourage others to make silage safety their number one priority and send all their home employees home safe. Video was produced by the IT person at a church in Roswell. Let's look at the first uh, four minutes. My name is Keith Bolson. I'll be 71 in May. I'm a retired uh, professor emeritus from Kansas State University. I got two degrees from the University of Illinois in animal science, uh, BS and MS degrees. Went to the University of Nebraska and earned a PhD in feedlot nutrition. Uh, Got a job at Kansas State University in July of 1971. And since uh, that time, I've, I've spent almost my entire career working with, with silage and silage management in, in both research programs at, at Kansas State and also uh, talking about silage management at the farm level. If a silage program isn't safe, nothing else about it matters. Because the most important thing in every silage program whether it's a farmer, a feedlot, or a dairy, is to send all of their employees home safe at the end of the day. I'm sorry, a possible what? Uh, farm death. Uh, uh, I've got, I need uh, a paramedic on the corner of Darby and Cherokee Road. Uh, and what is it? Just north of uh, Dexter. I don't understand, what do you need a paramedic for? Well, I consider it explain it to you, but I think there's a dead guy underneath a pile of corn. Okay, you think there's a deceased subject underneath the corn. That's what I need to know, because that's yes, going to require sir. deputies as well. Okay, thank you. Hold on, stay on the line with me. I'm not done yet. Okay. Has anybody been near the body or around it? We can't find the body, ma'am. We just, um, his truck's here, and he is not. And, we, and I don't have a contact for his wife. We've been trying to find a phone number. So you Sometimes, think he's under the corn, but you don't know? Yes, ma'am. That's, that's my, uh, and there's about 10 tons of corn that I need to move by hand. And I'm going to start doing that. But uh, I thought I'd better get somebody over here. And he was working today? Yes, ma'am. And we can't reach him on his phone. I can't find his phone. Sometimes he leaves it in the pickup or the truck. When's the last time he was seen? Um, he clocked, he, he stamped a ticket at 12.04 uh, in Dexter. So you believe he may be buried under the corn? Yes, ma'am, it's a good possibility. Okay, can you tell me um, roughly how does the corn load? Is it is this going to be corn full husk or is this going to be, what is it? Uh, uh, if you know what silage, corn silage. Okay, so it's going to be the corn silage. Yes, ma'am. They got about 10 tons of silage. 
Yes, they, they believe he might be under 10 tons of silage. He last clocks in at 12.04 this afternoon. His truck is there, but he's not. And that's the address of the business. Where exactly are you so we can identify where you're at? I'm right here at the location of the big giant uh, silage pits. Serious accidents okay. and fatalities in silage programs today simply do not have to happen. Mark, let's cut that. I won't, I won't play any more of the video. Uh, Lalamon uh, ordered 1,000 copies. Ruthie and I have 500. Uh, the video footage you saw was shot by a, 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 a quadriplegic online news reporter who was monitoring 911 calls in Roswell, went to the scene from the county road and shot the video. The last scene, the two sheriff's deputies were waiting for the coroner to arrive about 6.30 in the evening. Uh, the 45 minutes from the time the first employee arrived until 911 was called, Jason Leadingham was under three feet of silage. We have safety guidelines in, and let's go back to the slides, Mark. I'm not going to play any more of the video. Uh, we have the safety guidelines in uh, the handout. Uh, the buddy rule would have saved Jason's life because he could have been recovered. How many of you can bench press 1,200 pounds? Jason was under 1,200 pounds of silage, even though he was only buried by three feet. When the cubic foot of silage weighs 45 pounds, he had no chance to, to escape. He had silage in his mouth and was clutching silage in his hands. He left a two-year-old and a six-year-old and a grieving mother. Portal Farms had no silage safety program. Zip, zero, not a none. Ruthie and Lane leading him, his mother, are very close friends. Ruth, Ruthie lost her adult son, who was an attorney and single parent, 51, day, 51 weeks before we went on our first date. Let's make silage safety a very high priority this afternoon. And you know what the good news is, and I don't want to end on a downer. Everything we do as a silage industry to make our silage safer, makes it more efficient, lets us reach that single digit target. Isn't that good news? I'm going to scroll through these because I want to get to the last slide. You know, but let's put a silage safety program policy in place. Let's have meetings. Let's do the right thing. Ruthie and I want to thank University of Nebraska, Lincoln, Iowa State University, Lalamon, for giving us this opportunity. It's been a homecoming for me. My first time in Mead since I probably weighed my last pen of cattle here, Terry, in uh, 1970 when I was studying the sulfur requirement of feedlot cattle. You know, I was very glad to see my dissertation in his office yesterday. <laughs> At least somebody still got it. <laughs> and I'm delighted that uh, Larry Berger's been your department chairman the last seven years and, and uh, very, proud of, very proud of Larry. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll close. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll tell one more story. You can't get rid of me that easy. Larry, remember when this happened? Complacency. June 14, 1974. Doing those stage wheat silage, losing the harvest window, losing the moisture, a Saturday afternoon and in a hurry. It's about 2.30 in the afternoon, wasn't it? It was my turn to unplug the blower. I straddled the blower, shoved the pipe up, Larry was standing behind me, shoved my hand in and pulled it out, didn't look over my shoulder to see that PTO shaft was making one more slow revolution. Larry drove me to the hospital in the old red truck. The Lord did me a favor that afternoon. He took my fingers and not my grad students. Complacency, I got complacent, didn't I? I did something stupid. <laughs> Make a drawing, that's right, uh, for all the month. Five, five, five. Ooh, I'll take them out one at a time. Yeah, yes, fire away. How much rollback uh, do you recommend on the, the tarp uh, during 
Uh, I don't know what the weather is going to be, but we have to, we have to be realistic. Probably a, a, a three to four day period. I don't have an issue with a three to four day period unless I'm going to get a downpour of rain, which could change the dry matter dynamics of what's going to be going into that next ration, if I understand your question. So Jim, If it's a dangerous pile, I'm going to go weekly. And if it's a dangerous pile, we're going to be harnessed because we have two fatalities from going down with avalanches, pulling covering material off. I don't want to drop 20 feet onto asphalt or concrete. So I need, we need to be harnessed. We need to be harnessed if we can't jump down safely. If we can't reach up and touch the top of it, we don't need to be close to it. Rule of thumb is never closer than three times the height of the, of the, of the silage base because of the cantilever effect. But if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's an overfilled pit bunker pile, when we're pulling back, we need to be harnessed. Uh, I believe, uh, well, I know at least two large dairy corporations who, who are harnessing as we speak. Okay, there's one name. Can I tell them what we're giving away here? Oh, well, you tell them. Anyway, the Lollamon Safety, what do we call it, Bob? Safety, safety kit. Sa a Wallamon safety kit, which is really good. Which is really good. Not because Ruthie and I got to contribute to it, but because it's got a lot of things that are practical application and use for you on your program. Okay? We do have samples of these on the tables over here, so if you want to see what's in it. So, if you want to announce these. Tony, Tony Scott. Tony. Tony Scott. I didn't, I didn't read that, so you gotta come down. <laughs> no, that's a graduate student. For a lot of grad student, graduate students are ineligible. Nebraska Beef Council. Uh, I thought. He's with the Nebraska Beef Council. He might know good to produce. Okay, so this individual is probably gonna be able to use this uh, for an end user, Doug Strait. Nebraska right. Beef Council. Uh, Ron uh, Hovde? Rick. Rick. Rick Hovde. Rick uh, Hovde. Ron Hovde. Is that close? I really butchered that, didn't I? I really butchered that. What was it? Ron Hovde. Ron Hovde. Rick Ron Hovde. Okay. Two more. Beth Doran. Iowa State University. Beth Doran. Beth. All right. Check that one. Yep, we can do that. And uh, Corey Anstey. 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 See here. Corey. Got to be present to win. Ooh, That's bathroom new. break was costly. <laughs> <laughs> Haley Held. Haley Held. <laughs> or Haley Held. All right. And then one other last quick thing. Um, sorry, excuse my voice. <clears throat> Lalamond is also giving away a scholarship. And we have three undergraduate scholarships, a master's student and a PhD. Um, the three undergraduates are $2,500 scholarships and the other two are 3000 so the applications for that are due by the end of July. So talk to Lauren if you want some more information. We have one of our winners from last year here. So um, just since there's a lot of students, wanted to make sure that you guys are all aware of that also. So. Very good. Thank you. Let's thank those guys again.